Genesis 4 begins with hope. A child is born. But if you start paying attention to the names of the children, you immediately notice that this could get dicey. If you asked Eve, what's the name of your firstborn? She'd said Cain. And Cain is the word for, uh, the verb for acquire. Right? It, it's for possessions. And so it's like, I have acquired a child, kind of like I have bought a car. I, I have a new toy, right? Huh. Right? And then she'll, she has another child. What's the name of your second child, Eve? Well, his name is Hevel, which is the Hebrew for futility. It has a, the imagery of breath, like it's as futile and as passing and transitory as a breath of air. <sighs> and gone. So, your children. My, my, my little pet, my toy, and futility. Huh, you think this is going to go well? And so uh, that's how the family begins. Um, I would not recommend raising, naming your, you ever wonder where the term raising Cain comes from? This, this would be it, right? The, the first child, Cain. I have not inflicted that bad of a preacher joke on you in a long time, so I'm sorry every once in a while. Uh, Cain grows up and he's a farmer. And he hears from his parents about walking with God in the garden. And how are they going to know God? And so Cain is the one who comes up with the idea of, we'll, we'll do sacrifice. That's how we'll, we'll do this. We'll, we'll relate to God. We will have a, give a sacrifice. And he goes to his brother Abel and uh, says, let's, let's do this. Let's give a sacrifice of the finest that we have. And it's a good idea. The problem is, is that God does not have regard for Cain's sacrifice. He doesn't pay heed, some translations. I think that's way too formal. As I said, God doesn't pay as much attention to Cain's sacrifice. Right? This is about attention. If you have, ha if you have raised multiple children, you know how, what it's like when they both want your attention, and there's only so much attention to go around. And the child who you're not paying attention to... Yeah, that's what's happening here. Cain is not being paid attention to in the way he wants to. Right? Now, we don't know if there's a good reason for it. Right? It might be that Cain is used to getting most of the attention. He is the firstborn. And in this situation, God is giving them equal attention, and Cain doesn't like that. I mean, we don't know how this is unfolding, but there's this sense of uh, Cain doesn't feel like he's getting loved, right? He expects more attention, more love, more, more concern here. And this becomes sort of a running theme of Genesis, is, is siblings arguing for attention, siblings arguing for, for what they think they should get. Uh, down the road, in, in, uh, it's in Genesis 27, we, see, we hear Esau say to his dad, you gave a blessing to my dad, isn't there enough for me? Can't I get a blessing too? Right? And so we have uh, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, Rachel and Leah, Joseph and all of his brothers. Right? We have Jacob Genesis is a book about siblings who are bickering. And God usually favors the youngest. As the eldest son myself, that is a cause for concern, that uh, God is always favoring the youngest. But uh, God says to uh, Cain, why are you pouting? Like, why are you all down about this? Why are you angry? It'll be fine. Right? Can you imagine talking to a small child? Is this worth crying about? I say that multiple times a week. Uh, and then we get to the point that gets very serious. It goes from, why are you pouting, to sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. You can master it. You should master it. But sin is crouching at the door. This is a, a, a situation that demands action. The handling of sin will not be a passive thing. Because sin, its desire is for you, we read. And so if the imagery, if you get the, the sense that sin is like a large cat, a lion, uh, pound, ready to pounce, right, sitting at the door, that, that's about right, right. So this image of you have to do something about sin or else it's going to get you, that, that, that's what this is talking about. Now Cain does not master his sin. And we have the next problem of Genesis. Well, if you've been keeping track, the problems of Genesis thus far have been deception. I'll have an apple. It won't be a problem. Blame. She made me do it. Snake made me do it. Uh, then we had the seeing of children of acquisitions. Hey, what did you name your child? That's my new pet. Mm -hmm. That's problematic. The envy of a brother. And now we have murder. Cain brings his brother into a field and kills him, and his blood soaks into the ground. And as Abel dies, we realize, do we know a single word that Abel ever spoke? No. 
He is voiceless. Victims, that's what victims usually are, voiceless. We never know anything he says. God then finds Cain and he asks Cain, where is your brother? And I want you to hear that with the same tone of voice that God asked Adam and Eve. Who told you you're naked? Right? This is not the question. It's like when you ask a, a small child, where'd the cookies go? You know where the cookies went. Why are you asking, where did the cookies go? You're asking because you want them to fess up. Where's your brother? And then maybe he might say, well, you know God, right? That's not what he does. Last week we had the first love song of scripture as uh, Adam looks at Eve and says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, which you can sing to your loved one on Tuesday if you want. Uh, this time we get the first sarcasm of scripture. We get the first snark, right? Where, where is your brother? I don't know, right? How many times have you heard that? Hey, what? I don't know. I'm not in charge of him. I'm not. Am I my brother's keeper? Again, I think the Bible's way, we translate it way too formally. Because am I my brother's keeper sounds just so, I mean, it's just so high. It's far more of a sense of, why should I care? Eh, right? I don't know. Eh. God does not directly respond to this sarcasm. He cuts the chase, right? The ground screams with the blood of your brother. And now, Cain, you are under a curse. If you want to look for the curse in Genesis, remember, in the first chapters, Adam and Eve, they have their snack. It's a problem. But the land is cursed, and the snake is cursed. They are not. Now, Cain is cursed. Now Cain is going to bear the consequence of the first sin. This is the first sin of Scripture. The first sin of Scripture is not having a snack. The first sin of Scripture is murder of a brother. And the consequence of sin, the ground that you have worked, your land, the farmland that you love, that you have walked day after day after day, will reject you. Your crops will flounder, you will wander, you are cut off from your people. This happens because Cain did not see, indeed, that he was his brother's keeper, and he is cut off from family and neighbors and land, and can you think of a more horrible fate for a farmer? Right? A farmer without his land and neighbors, what is he? Right? That, that's a horrible, horrible fate. Sin has closed this door. The consequence of sin is Cain's future is changed. He is a farmer without his land, and Cain is horrified. This burden is too great, he exclaims. Sin has pounced, right? There are going to be consequences. God chose justice and mercy, though. Justice and mercy, this becomes the running theme of how God interacts with people in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture, right? Justice and mercy. Justice, there are consequences to Cain's actions. The farmer loses his land, but there is mercy. When you kill someone, your life is forfeit. I mean, that's just the logic of it, right? If, um, if I murder someone, I have taken the most precious thing there is, and the justice is to take the most precious thing I have, which is my life. It is utter justice that when someone kills, their life is forfeit. But this is justice and mercy. At justice, there are consequences. The farmer loses his land. Mercy, he deserves to die, but he doesn't. Justice and mercy become how God works, God's loving kindness. It is something, uh, it, loving kindness is how it's translated in the King James. They, they are essential and they are bound to each other. In verse 17, then at the end of this, something kind of odd happens. Uh, another lurch, you might say. Last week we talked about, did they get kicked out of paradise, or did they outgrow paradise? And I said, I think they outgrew paradise. They kind of lurched forward, and it's not, they sort of, the step, they took the next step in growing up. By no means graceful, but it was forward motion. In verse 17, we read of another lurch forward. Cain has experienced the consequences of what happens when he is not his brother's keeper. He's experienced the, uh, this mix of justice and mercy. Right? And, and he holds that together. He now knows firmly that he is his brother's keeper and that we have to hold justice and mercy together. And he takes that and he builds the first city. In verse 17 we read that he builds the first city. It's not like he built Columbia, Missouri, 100,000 people. 
but he had uh, pe people started to gather. And what made it possible? Why could people gather together? Why could Cain pull this off? Because he understood what it takes for people to live together. What do you have to have if you're going to live together? You have to have an understanding that you are your brother's keeper and that you have to treat each other with justice and mercy. Because if you don't understand that you are your brother's keeper and that you have to treat your, each other with justice and mercy, what's that look like as soon as you put multiple people in the room? It gets ugly, right? You have to, we have to hold on to that. And, and so he builds this city built on what he has learned from this. But notice he doesn't name it for himself. Cain is always the farmer who's lost his land. His son Enoch, the city is named for his son. It is Enoch City. He is setting up so that his children live better than he did. So what do we make of this story of family drama? Well, a few short things. First, we notice that sin is always crouching and that uh, mastering sin is a lifelong quest. We notice that, yes, we are our brother's keeper, and any time we w find ourselves wondering, should I care about that other person, the answer is yes. Now, we might need to care for them at a distance. Sometimes I can't care for you in the same room or the same state or the same county, right? But we can always be praying for our enemies. We can always be praying and caring about the other person in some way. We can never say, nope, I don't care about that person. Third, in a lurch forward, similar to the lurch out of Eden, Cain has experienced what it takes to begin to bring people together. That we are our brother's keepers, that we have to have this mix of justice and mercy, and that holding justice and mercy together is what allows us to, to be healthy, right? Justice without mercy is cold and cruel. Mercy without justice is just a pushover, right? We have to hold the two together. And that's a challenge, because wouldn't it be easier if we just had a God who said justice? Right? That'd be clean. Or a God who said mercy. That'd be nice. It'd be easier. But to have justice and mercy together means that we are always going to be questioning and pondering, what is the correct mix here of justice and mercy? Because all of us lean one way or the other, don't we? Some of us lean towards justice, some of us lean towards mercy, and all of us need each other to be arguing about it and saying, What's the proper balance in this situation? Right? There are always consequences. The farmer loses his land. There's always mercy. The murderer has his life spared. And there's another future for him. Finally, because we can be people of justice and mercy, we have hope. And, and that's the hope we see, not, we see it with this, right? Cain and Abel come to a bad end, the two of them as a family. But down the road, Joseph is able to make up with his brothers. Jacob and Esau are able to reconcile and come to peace. We see that, yes, the first family starts out poorly. But we see that in the other families of Genesis, they are able to reconcile and work things out. It's the promise that the family that we have today does not have to be bound to the family that was yesterday. And the family that we have tomorrow is not bound to the situation we're in today. Our families, our brothers, our sisters, our communities are not bound to the past. For we can practice justice and mercy and we can get somewhere better. In the end, I think that's what we remember about Genesis, the creation, is that God said it's good. God didn't say creation was perfect. God didn't say it was polished, smooth, chromed, like everything was exactly how it ought to be. God just said it's good. I think that means God said it's good enough to begin, and now it's time for you as humanity to start growing up. I don't think we're done growing up. I think we're still struggling to learn what does it mean to live as people who balance justice and mercy. And thanks be to God, we can. Amen. Amen. Please join with me as we confess together the, uh, our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand and join as we do so. We have a sit-in uh, space bar clicker because technology has...